be happy and thankful to the organizers for giving me this unique opportunity to reflect on the facets of the newly coined National Education Policy 2020. I would like to recognize the presence of uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Anna Technical University, uh, Dr. Surapa. This morning he told me he would definitely participate and listen to my speech. This is what he said. I hope he's here, he's participating. Now, let us first have a quick glance at the four parts of the report on the new education policy 2020. Part one, school education, part two, higher education, part three, other key areas, and part four, making it happen. The organizers asked me to confine my speech to higher education. In order to add to the correctness and completeness of my speech, my presentation, I would like to reflect on the facets of uh, the new policy on school education because stakeholders of higher education should know from which background, with what background, the students are entering institutions of higher education. So let us first go to the principal contours and tenets of the new education policy. It actually draws on the sustainable development goals. It's a good start. Any initiative undertaken by any government, any program uh, being embarked upon anything is always within the global development agenda. You cannot do it without the global development agenda. So Millennium Development Goals had um, <clears throat> 18 goals, and the eight, uh, eight goals, 18 targets, and 48 indicators. Like that, the sustainable development goals also have several, several goals, targets, and indicators. There are 17 goals, uh, around 245 targets, and uh, 200 and, uh, 167 targets, and 247 indicators. The advantage of coining any program within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goal 4 is that we can pick up those indicators, targets and indicators. There are 10 targets for Sustainable Development Goal 4. And there are nearly 40 indicators. We can pick up all the 40 indicators to measure the extent and the effectiveness of our policy interventions and the institutional direction towards achieving the stated goals. This is the advantage. A progress report can be prepared periodically using those parameters. This is the advantage of coining any initiative within the framework of the Global Development Agenda. So Sustainable Development Goal 4 ensues. It says, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong, lifelong learning. This is the objective stated in and the uh, SDG 4. So within the framework of which, and the new policy is aimed at assuring in the availability of and access to quality education. This is very important. If you look at the previous policies, which were coined in 1968 and 86, and they talk about the equity. They don't ignore equity. They also want to ensure the availability of and access to education. But this time they have added a new word called availability of and access to quality education. So from this sense, this is definitely part of the current transformative shift from quantitative increase to qualitative improvement. This is happening. And to this end, topmost priority is given to teachers. The report, actually the policy recognizes the crucial role being played by teachers. Teachers constitute the nerve center of the new education policy. I was very happy to read the phrase the, uh, saying that this new policy is aimed at re-establishing teachers. Amazing, this is very interesting. Re-establish teachers because they are the one to lead, at least in terms of mindset. They should be one step ahead of our march towards the frontiers of best practice in offering uh, higher education. So let us go to the next one. 
governing principles. I think it is unfair on my part to read out what is on the screen. It is self-explanatory. Let me pick up a few words here and there, phrases and words here and there. It talks about unique capabilities of each student should be revealed. Then uh, uh, fundamental literacy and numeracy should be dramatically increased. Then there should be no hard separations between arts and science. This is the new aspect. And the multidisciplinary and holistic education. In a 65-page document, these two words, multidisciplinary and holistic education, uh, are mentioned more than 20 times. More than 20 times. The whole thing is attuned to this, offering multidisciplinary and holistic education. And emphasis on um, uh, under conceptual understanding rather than learning for exams. Like that, there are so many things you can see, contours and tenants here, uh, governing the new education policy. I would like to summarize all these 19 points in one sentence. I would like to say the purpose of education is to make the students intellectually trained, morally upright, spiritually inspired, and socially committed. This is the summary of the 19 principles which govern the new education policy. And if you just remember this word, the purpose of this statement, the purpose of education is to make the students uh, intellectually trained, morally upright, spiritually inspired, and socially committed. And from that perspective, you look at any word or any phrase, you will find an answer here. You will definitely find it there. So let me go to the next slide. A quick glance at the school education and the new pedagogical and curriculum structure. As you know, the old system of 10 plus 2 is removed by, replaced by uh, 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. And you all know that. You know, I don't have to convince you. Every day you read a lot about it from the media. So I don't have to elaborate all these things. The real thing is here, the good thing is here, uh, the preschool becomes a part of school education. That is the major improvement. So you cannot say that only rich uh, children of rich families can go to uh, LKG and UK, UKG, but no. Before they reach even the age three, they have the advantage of doing it and uh, they actually get to breakfast also. There is another unique aspect of this. First to food for thought and then thoughts. This is the point here. And by the time they join the class one, they become school fit. This is how it is going. So then the plus three, that is um, <coughs> preparatory uh, education and level, then mid, middle, uh, middle school and secondary school. And uh, do, during these the years, school years, they're all exposed to different things and up to eighth standard to the extent possible. The report says as far as it's possible, to the extent possible, let the children learn everything in the mother tongue. This is another unique aspect of it. See, three presidents hailing from Tamil Nadu of India, Mr. Radha, Dr. Radha Krishnan, Mr. Venkat Raman, Dr. Abdul Kalam, they all studied in mother tongue in a small village in a primitive schools, in primitive schools. This is the background. Their life experience gives us a very good lesson. And that is, I think, when they learn the subject at the very young age in mother tongue, they easily comprehend, very easily comprehend. And it is said that before the age of um, uh, six, before the children reach the age of six, the cumulative development happens. Cumulative brain development happens. When the children are born, everybody gets the same size of brain, but the ignorance envelops the brain. And education is used as a very good equipment means to erase the ignorance that envelops the brain. So the type of education they will undergo in the preschool will be a lot of fun. Going to the school will be a great source of joy because upon arrival, they get breakfast and learning through different means, non-traditional means is also equally a different source of joy. So they create that in that process, they actually enable the children to reveal their creative potential. This is what the report says, creative potential. The education will be offered at the early stage in such a way uh, to facilitate the cumulative development of the brain by erasing ignorance that envelops the brain and at the same time and making the children reveal their potential, creative potential. So let us now go to 
higher education major problems again there is a long list of uh, and the problems stated here uh, a highly fragmented system of education we have now less emphasis on development of cognitive skills and learning outcome a rigid separation of disciplines with the early specialization and streamlining limited access particularly in the socio economically disadvantaged areas limited teacher and the institutional autonomy and inadequate mechanisms for merit based career development a lesser emphasis on research at the most universities and the sub optimal governance it is said it is you know i think it, it, it is said that um, grossly overruled and undergoverned this is what we normally say sub optimal government uh, governance and the leadership of um, higher educational institution and ineffective regulatory system regulatory system may be there the purpose is not very often served and i can cite many examples as we go on large affiliating universities resulting in low standards of undergraduate education and i think the affiliated in a system will disappear over a period of 10 to 15 years these are all the major problems but in the light of the major problems it is important to look at the major challenges i would like to spend some time here the world is undergoing rapid revolutionary complete changes and we have to keep pace with the rapidly changing transformative shift triggered by technological marvels everything is triggered by technological marvels you know and um, this is uh, uh, the, the, unless we keep pace with the rapidly changing facets we will be out of context then offering degrees with a low level of functional literacy rate this is a major problem here with the higher education system it is not the literacy that matters what matters is the functional literacy rate functional literacy rate refers to the percentage of literates imbued with enhanced adaptive capabilities of uh, capabilities and skills to use modern technology and devices and to commercialize new knowledge this is what is called functional literacy rate when there is low level of functional literacy rate what will happen the you know the students will be uh, prepared for entry into employment and not for employment this is the follow what is happening is like this now uh, actually if you look at uh, the the functional literacy rate uh, in um, different countries it's very high you know if the functional literacy rate is very low naturally students who are coming out of the universities will not fit into any job anywhere this is what we are seeing it through our own eyes through campus recruitment students are uh, recruited on day 1 in the corporate sector they are not operational because they are not fit for that unless they undergo six month training in the company they are not qualified to work they are not technically qualified to work they are not operational on day 1 so we prepare the students for entry into employment and not for employment grossly over regulated and under governed this i already said lack of priority focus on research and innovation this is another thing happening in fact you know it is not fair to expect all educational institutions to serve as world class research and innovation centers it's not fair it's not fair because the purpose of education is fair of course research is very important innovation is equally important to address that they, they have introduced the research intensive universities then the teaching intensive university that problem is very well handled i will discuss it when we come to that particular slide need to introduce knowledge technology and entrepreneurship making job seekers job makers this is crucial that is already evolving that is definitely evolving everywhere we can see even at the school level they establish um, what is called the atal uh, tinkering mission atal tinkering mission they actually ask the schools to provide uh, the government with the name 1500 square feet something like the size of room and that laboratory that lab laboratory is that is it is called atal tinkering lab that is established in schools and that lab will be equipped with modern technology disruptive technologies 3d printer robotics and the internet of things so anybody can go there students can go there play with the tinker with the tinkering they will be tinkering with all these things disruptive technologies available there 
and then they will invent something invent something so it, this is to create the innovative mindedness of the students that's already happening and with that they if they can survive that they can make um, capital out of that this is the idea behind it and at the college level they do it's called yesterday i happened to listen to the inaugural uh, function of uh, the anna technical university which inaugurated the incubator center within the framework of the so called actal innovation mission uh, sponsored by this uh, national institute for transforming india niti and uh, the vice chancellor of the anna technical university made a fantastic speech and it was a grand event and they got the huge fund i think 10 uh, A thousand, uh, I think, ten uh, crores from the government within the framework of NITI uh, for fostering this, promoting this, and this is, I think, they provided them with the two thousand five hundred square feet of land. And where that particular and uh, the so-called um, the and the center, they call it incubation incubation center, but it is actually called Atal Incubation Mission. Okay, and that particular room is equipped with all disruptive technologies. disruptive technologies are actually taking us to a situation where we, uh, we are we are forced to face something called creative destruction they make the world things stumble and we have to make use of that disruptive technologies are advanced digital production system artificial intelligence augmented reality additive manufacturing big data management cloud computing then 3d printer then electro mobility then internet of things internet of energy internet of uh, uh, everything internet of everything and uh, all these things are happening all these disruptive technologies oh, all these disruptive technologies are there and the students at the university level are expected to make optimal use of it and uh, play with that make use of that and through self motivation or under the guidance of somebody and if they are able to invent something and uh, which can enable them to emerge as uh, knowledge and technology based uh, entrepreneurs they will be job creators so this is a very good program and i i hope all universities will follow then uh, need uh, yes then lack of interactive framework between institutions and uh, and the industry sector this is another thing now in an ideal <coughs> national innovation system new knowledge is generated by institutions exploited by laboratories and commercialized by dynamic firms so such a high degree of interactive framework exist only in selected countries i think singapore is, uh, is in singapore is well known for that for establishing a very high degree of interactive framework between institutions and the corporate sector that's why singapore always ranks at the top of the countries in the list on the scale of industrial performance for 20 consecutive years a small country virtually no resource virtually no resource i would say eh, is um, managed to uh, reach the first rank sustain the first rank on the scale of industrial performance because of that because normally countries think that they have to convert their resource based to comparative advantages into competitiveness but now what is being systematically proved is countries are enhancing their global competitiveness without resource based comparative advantage using human ingenuity as the infinite source of wealth creation so that should evolve then teachers mindset should be as i is i already mentioned and i think there is a very good program to change the change teachers the role of teachers enhance the quality of teachers i used to classify teachers into three groups that is um, the logical thinker aggressive achiever and gentle helper an ideal teacher will have a unique blend of having 30% logical thinker 30% uh, aggressive achiever and 40% gentle helper so normally this unique blend the unique combination of being uh, aggressive achiever logical thinker and gentle helper happens only after several years of experience but here the new education policy is aimed at creating an environment which will enable the teachers when someone joins an institution as a teacher on day one he will benefit from that unique blend <clears throat> so policy vision for re energizing higher education the report says 
that the ultimate aim is to bring back the great legacy, the great Indian tradition. India was the global leader in higher education in the fifth century. Take the example of Nalanda University alone. It was originally the Buddhist monastery, okay? And they started teaching multidisciplinary subjects. And the whole world wanted to come to Nalanda to learn. And there was actually an entrance exam for these people. And uh, uh, only 20% failed. So 80% failed in the competitive exam. And the students came from different parts. It appears that students used to study Buddhism elsewhere in Indonesia or somewhere else in order to pass the exam here and then come and sit for the examination conducted. And it was hosting 10,000 students and 2,000 teachers were employed. This is a great legacy. The new policy aims at bringing that great legacy of moving towards multidisciplinary universities and colleges. This is the ultimate aim of this. Okay, then a holistic approach, as I said, multidisciplinary and holistic, these two words appear very, very frequently here, uh, developing all, all the capabilities of the students. One should not concentrate only on one subject, he should be well, I would put it like, he should be well versed in one subject and versed in other subjects. Then it adds to his total personality formation. And then uh, faculty and institutional autonomy, revamping curriculum, pedagogy and assessments, then merit-based appointments. I think these are all already stated. One interesting thing is they are going to introduce light but tight regulations to governing universities. I think this is a must uh, because uh, we, we know what happens in aided colleges. Eh? And when, um, when the vacancies are there, when they are advertised, uh, and uh, then uh, how the candidates are being selected. And that type of commercialization will be completely erased. That, this is what they say when they, what they mean, when they say light but very tight regulations and increased inclusion of the open distance education in order to ensure equity, anybody can participate. Provision of require, in, required infrastructure for <clears throat> physically disabled persons also to participate in higher education. Now, the structure and uh, the degree. One year certificate post, two years, uh, you can, no, you, you can get a diploma and leave if you want. Three years, you get a degree. Fourth year, you can. I would say this is a unique, unique, unique opportunity. Now, I will just share with you my experience. When I retired from the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, I got an opportunity to serve as a, an expert in a committee on nuclear knowledge management uh, run by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Okay. And uh, they were trying to strengthen the nuclear innovation systems beyond the energy generation. That means concentrating on non-energy uses of the nuclear power for productive and service activities like in agriculture, industry, and health. You know, nuclear devices are used uh, for productive and service activities. So at one point, there was a suggestion to fund um, the, this MSc degree in nuclear science and PhD in nuclear science. I raised my objection. I said that, what will they do? Having completed MSc in nuclear science and PhD in nuclear science, who will give them job? I already know two guys from one of the African countries driving taxis in Vienna with the MSc in nuclear science. So it may be more productive to support the guys who just to get a certificate in nuclear science and get themselves employed maybe in the health sector, a diploma in nuclear science and work. So let us just render technical assistance to enhance the adaptive capabilities of these people who are working in hospitals, agriculture and industry, dealing with nuclear devices, than to enable them to give them a degree which may not be useful for getting it. So it's a very good idea, one year you can go anywhere, but you can come back and the due weightage will be given to the student for the preceding academic record. That means for the, all the credits he has acquired, then he can, having worked somewhere for two years, again, he can come and work. And then this is, this is the type of thing it is introduced. And the fourth year is actually, it can be a three-year degree or four-year degree. Four-year degree means with the research. This is a golden opportunity, golden opportunity for universities and colleges to make optimal use of it. You know what, 
in the ranking of countries when when organizations visit institutions to rank countries uh, institutions they just ask the first parameter they ask the first question is how many research papers have been produced by your staff and students published in journals recognized by the institute for scientific information this is what they ask that's the first parameter if the number of uh, research papers is very high then your ranking really goes up international ranking goes up so if all the students doing the fourth year are compelled to write and the research papers published in recognized journals then it will boost the ranking of all the institutions in fact uh, three or four students can join together as co-authors and write and uh, there is a mechanism to be established to facilitate that one and then if the number of research papers turned on by any institution uh, then that institution will definitely enhance its ranking then provision of multiple entry and exit i already explained it <clears throat> then type of institutions research intensive universities teaching intensive universities autonomous degree granting colleges graded autonomy and graded accreditation to colleges against benchmark parameters now uh, at a quick glance uh, you can think that you know there are ambiguities what is the difference between research intensive university does it mean that they will not be interested in teaching no they will be equally interested in intensive teaching so what do you mean by teaching intensive university does it mean that they will not concentrate on research they will also do research it is not a difference without a distinction there is a difference there is definitely a difference research intensive universities mean researchers come out with some discoveries they invent something patents are registered and patents are commercialized that's why at one point i said it is unfair to expect all universities and colleges in india to serve as world class research and innovation universities so if you want to be a world class research and innovation universities then you have to produce number of patents and the patents should be commercialized number of patents registered number of patents commercialized now we don't have to do that the purpose of education something else but a part of a research institutions a part of the university some universities and can be uh, can focus only on this dimension inventing things and um, getting patents registered and commercializing those patents but teaching universities will be concentrating on teaching at the same time they will also do research what type of research writing research papers and this will dramatically enhance the knowledge of the teachers if teachers are involved in writing research papers it will definitely definitely lead to a um, large number of research papers and it will also enhance the knowledge and capabilities and skills eventually the students will benefit for that we have to establish, establish an enabling environment policy environment and the institutional environment there should be some incentive system you know no one lives on moral incentives i know some colleges give 10000 rupees to teachers who come out with a research paper published in journals recognized by uh, the institute for scientific information it's called isa journal articles if a, if your staff member or your group of staff member they come out with a very good paper already published in isa journals and they get 10000 rupees this is the inter- incentive system then some teachers are very good in their subjects they are definitely capable of writing original original ideas unfortunately language may be a big problem then you arrange some type of mechanism to settle that one you can hire retired professors actually retired professors english professors and um, great scholars who are very good at editorial completion and correcting the language mistake and all. that is allowed at, as long as it is duly acknowledged in the in the a paper that means the editorial completion was done by some that's accept so this ways there are many ways through which we can facilitate we can actually encourage staff members to write so i hope i have made the difference between these two research intensive and teaching intensive university autonomous degree granting and colleges and as i said the, the so called affiliate <coughs> affiliation will disappear in the long run and uh, then graded autonomy means according to the performance and uh, the the way they demonstrated the progress i the, the grading will be given to the level of autonomy given to each a college against some benchmark parameters then rationale for the new approach okay 
the 21st century requirements need creative individuals creative thinking critical thinking you know these are all very very important things I, I, the report all, even when it talks about the school education it talks about critical thinking creative thinking something like it's very very important i am an economist let me give you one example uh, when my teacher tells me I, according to adam smith the father of economics <coughs> who wrote the <coughs> first book in economics in 1776 according to adam smith the end of production is consumption my think critical mindset will tell the teacher no sir the end of production is not consumption it is being increasingly proved that the end of production is learning learning is continuous when i produce something <coughs> i want excuse me when i produce something i want to learn from the competitor my comparators my uh, distributor and the consumers everybody in order to effect further improvement in our my product superior over others so again the production is not consumption it is learning and the innovative teaching will enable the students discover the non obvious see you write 7 and 8 on the board and say come on say something about this student may it is 7 8 when you add it is 15 so when you detect 7 from 8 something else is there something else is there if they are able to say one is an odd number and another one is even number they are able to discover the non obvious during the innovative teaching creative teaching this is what exactly so critical thinking is very important let me give you another an, give you another example that is um, according to an economist ricardo uh, countries are supposed to convert their resource based comparative advantages into competitiveness i already said that but today without resource based comparative advantages countries are enhancing global competitiveness using human ingenuity as the infinite source of wealth creation this is critical thinking so this is very very important for wealth creation okay so 21st century recourse let's say the previous policies let me say go back to the previous policy why what is the need for compelling reasons and convincing arguments for the new policy the previous policies 1968 policy they were called the actual national policy on education the both policies were called the national policy on education the latest one is called Uh, education policy that's a difference okay of course it's not a big difference to be honest and uh, it was formulated the first one was formulated in 68 then after 20 years the second one came that was in 86 then 34 years we lived with the world one 34 years uh, we lived with the world one in the meantime so many things happened so many things happened you know um the uh, This, I, let me just uh, ex- ex- give you this example. We are very prou- proud of Nalanda University in the fifth century. We were the global leaders. Okay. Until uh, the first industrial revolution, the eighteenth century industrial revolution, there was no connection between universities and the pattern of production, because the then pattern of production did not demand skills from universities. European universities were established 600 years before the evolution of industrial revolution. The industrial revolution in England started only in 1750, 18th century industrial revolution. So before 1750, actually, uh, there were universities, well-established universities, but they were all teaching subjects like ethics, politics, psychology, philosophy, uh, then uh, history, then metaphysics, little bit of astronomy, something like that. and it was not serving the productive sectors at all because the then pattern of production did not demand did not demand skills from the university because at, during before the revolution there was what is called what happened was industrious revolution that was then the household sector was responding to growing demand for goods and services and universities had nothing to do with that and then came the so called uh, and the first industrial revolution 1750 to 1850 so many things happened uh, in uh, england that made england the pioneer of industrial revolution and then the second industrial revolution american economy the great ag- agrarian economy was converted uh, agrarian economy into a mighty industrial power between 1860 and 1910 and then the third industrial revolution and japan started penetrating everything so what happened was during the crystal palace exhibition this is very important kindly listen um uh, this, during the crystal palace exhibition in 1886 uh, 
American goods were the center of attraction. Everybody was fascinated by uh, the American goods. They were, they wanted to know what was happening in America. So the British, whose uh, forefathers were primarily instrumental for the evolution of uh, the first industrial revolution, went to America. Japan also went to America to see what happened. The functional literacy rate, what I said, the functional literacy rate in the US was very high at that time, 86. 86% of the students were imbued with enhanced adaptive capabilities and skills to use modern technology and to commercialize new knowledge. And then afterwards, during the next Crystal Palace exhibition, Japanese goods started penetrating the whole world in the early 1980s. So everybody went to Japan to see what was happening there. The functional literacy rate in Japan was 99%. So now that clearly shows the need for the new industrial policy. Unless the, the, the new education policy, education policy, unless our institutions um, play a key role in enabling the students to keep pace with the rapidly changing facets of processing, design, and marketing, and we will not grow. Wealth creation will be at stake. So I think I have given enough justification for the new education policy. Personal academic accomplishment to contribute to society. Eventually, whatever you achieve, you should be able to contribute to society. That's why I said that intellectually trained, morally upright, spiritually inspired, and socially committed. Eventually, your enhanced capabilities and skills should be useful to society. And socially conscious and skilled the nation and find the implement and solutions to one problem. We should be able to find out our own problems for our own solutions to with our own uh, educated population. Now, next, next one. In the pursuit. How to offer that? The IITs are expected to offer and the multidisciplinary education. In fact, in many institutions, it's already there. VIT started Academy of Social Sciences 15 years ago. They used to invite me. Every year they invite me. Last time they invited me to address the students of the Academy of Social Science on ethics and mor 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 ethics, ethics and morality. Yeah, ethics and morality in workplace. I had to deliver a two-hour speech uh, there. Now see the type of uh, things which are being taught in an institution which is supposed to focus on technology. VIT is the Bellur Institute of Technology, and they have a huge operation for the a segment called Akad and the Nurul Islam University. That's the same. They have a separate college for arts and science. It's all in the campus. Now it's a matter of dovetailing uh, and how to enable the students. The purpose of multidisciplinary and holistic education is to make the students learn everything, whatever it is. It's like liberal arts, you know, and the colleges of liberal arts are now flourishing like anything, you know, they are in great demand. Very, very you know, I know one bright guy, a son of a very close friend of mine in Vienna, very bright guy, great analytical thinker, brilliant writer, you know, and he opted to study actually history, something, philosophy or history. His father was a bit upset. Such a great uh, intellectual giant, why he is opting for it? What can he do? Something like that. Then at one point, at one year, he studied something and ne next year, he wanted to study German literature. And eventually, recently, he wrote a thesis, PhD thesis on and the 17th century German literature on managing public debt. It looks funny. You know, why he is wasting his time, energy, everything like this. And what happens, you know, now when he got the PhD and people who attended his public defense in the UK, and they invited him to join top universities like... Uh, um, okay, the, the Harvard University, uh, Princeton University, unconditional admission for doing his postdoctoral diploma. And he's in great demand for university job. So this is, this is changing the whole thing. When I went to Vienna, you know, I wanted to join one of the universities. I asked the guy what subject I can take because of the language constraint. He said, you join, register your name for and the computer software, something like that. I, 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 I'm not used to it, I am an economist and I should be very economical on these things. And so I was a bit hesitant. Then I realized when I mingled with them, I was told that the students can join for medicine one year. If he is fed up with that, he can go and uh, register his name in the College of Music or College of Drama or somewhere, a totally different thing. 
then he comes back to the medical college to um, get some more credits and he can finish as long as you are able to finish that is for me it looked very strange in the beginning then i realized i will i will show you something uh, let us just uh, for re just to clean all ambiguities let us just to have a quick glance at the so called facets facets of multidisciplinary education okay now what are the things here literature music uh, indology art dance theater education look at the statistics pure and applied science social sports translation and interpretation subjects needed to multidisciplinary stem in education the environment will be established in this so all these things when the, the question is now how can you expect the students to concentrate on this when he wants to concentrate on his major how to do that there is a challenge to combine how to combine i think we will learn a lot uh, during the first phase they have already selected 20 institutions of eminence bit is one among 10 private institutions and 10 public institutions are selected for the first phase during the first phase we will learn lot about it how we are going to come and then to support the support Uh, the so called multidisciplinary and holistic education i would like to quote uh, 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 steve jobs eh? the famous apple guy he said it is in apple's dna that technology married with uh, technology is not enough it says technology is not enough i think i got to escape uh, to read that okay it's okay i can i can do that Techn he says technology is not enough it is technology married with arts married with humanities will result uh, will create results that make our heart sing what a fantastic statement technology is not enough you have to learn humanities you have to learn other things and then a famous guy a cloud burner i just uh, took it googled and uh, managed to get this one a physician who is has learned only his science cannot be sure of his own science can you imagine a physician who has learned his science cannot be sure of his own science there is unless he learns the physician has to learn he learns something about other sciences that's why i said you can be well versed in one subject and versed in other subjects let me give you a typical example which is uh, which is bearing relevance to the current context we are all suffering from uh, the covid it has turned everything upside down and the covid did not uh, stem from nature it is stemmed from our misbehavior with nature now how we are behaving ourselves and we are all moving towards new normal okay now you you may be hearing lot about the hospitals which actually cure these people give best possible treatment to save the lives of people are the hospitals which are trying to combine allopathy with um, uh, siddha ayurvedic homeopathy and and uh, traditional medical practices it is proven it is systematically proven if a doctor knows only allopathy he does not know anything about uh, siddha if he does not know anything about uh, homeopathy or ayurvedic medicine and you know he may not be able to treat the patient properly it is systematically proved we are seeing it with our own eyes now i am not flattering my friend uh, mr faisal khan you know faisal khan my friend faisal i call him faisal we are, we are like brothers okay he started this um, naturopathy in his hospital nurul islam medicity long back 10 years ago he started that and they have, i they have an isolated ward i heard and it is i think they have converted the ladies hostel into an isolated ward doing extremely well in treating covid patients and um, they not even a single patient transmitted the disease to anybody either to the uh, the medical staff or to the visitors calling on him not even single and no deaths so far amazing i salute salute uh, faisal i hope faisal is listening here listening to me and i really salute eh? uh, i want to place on record my sincere i am not telling a lie this is true and and uh, i don't know what is the impact the natural body uh, the inside the campus is making on this what type of impact i have not seen that i am sure this is contributing to that I, I visited that block once, the natural body. Once, uh, Mr. Faisal Khan took me to the and showed everything. I was impressed. At that time, I was wondering why they are running in this parallel to this one. And I now I realize how important this is. I think this is. I think there is a good rationale for 
as a multidisciplinary and holistic education, as we can see it from the even Steve Jobs, he, he, he makes the statement, technology is, alone is not enough. It should be married with other arts and humanities. Now that's why colleges of liberal arts, Jindal school, they call it Jindal School of Liberal Arts. That is doing extremely well now. Now, just to make things crystal clear, what are humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and formal science and technology? You have all this list I have furnished here. Art, humanities, literature, linguistic, religion, ethics, modern, all these things. Then social sciences, you know that history, psychology, sociology, politics, gender <laughs> studies, anthropology, etc., etc. Natural sciences include astronomy, biology, physics, botany, and zoology, geography, etc. Then formal sciences. Actually, in the formal sciences, they did not add technology, but technology is very, very important. This is a mistake they made. It includes logic, statistics, mathematics, and technology. Technology is crucial. You know, for a long time, people were computing sources of growth only using three parameters, external demand, internal demand, and import substitution. They did not realize that the incidence of technical progress is a potential source of growth. They could not include this parameter the so called the contribution made by technology to growth because data was not available how to compute that now we have the data some parameters you can use the share of medium and high tech share of medium high tech and sophisticated products in manufacturing value added the share of medium high tech and sophisticated products in manufactured export these are all the two parameters that can be used to assess the extent to which uh, technology contributed. If you look at the growth pattern of developed countries, you will realize that this, the incidence of technical progress accounted for more than 60% of growth in all these segments. Then external demand, then internal demand and all these things. And in the new first and second generations of newly industrializing countries, technology played, played a major role. So now the new policy, coming back to the new policy, is expecting a, a student of technology to know a little bit of other things. As I cited the example of the doctor, allopathy doctor, who is supposed to know something about uh, and the Ayurvedic, Siddha, and, uh, and uh, traditional medicinal uh, practices and, uh, and medicinal knowledge. Uh, all these things are supposed to be known. So the real challenge, the formidable challenge is how to combine this. My dear friends, I think we are going to learn this during the course of implementation. This is really fun, uh, formidable. Our prime minister himself said that uh, implementing the new education policy is a formidable challenge. I think a few days ago, he made a statement. So he is neither unaware, not ignorant of the problems involved in the practical implementation of uh, the... So creating an enabling environment for research in the colleges. I actually made a marginal reference to that. And um, uh, as I said, uh, you encourage these staff members and students to write this research articles and then and create a mechanism and incentive system. Some incentives should be given to them. As I mentioned, uh, 10,000 rupees per article is not bad. That will be an incentive for them. And see to it that that mechanism is effectively operational in the campus. And then if for want of language proficiency, if they are not, they have innovative ideas based on primary data, they may come out with some inferences that may be a relevance to policy implications. That's okay. It's a very innovative, but they are not able to write it in proper English. Then provide them with some assistance. Hire retired, retired teachers who are very good at uh, writing impeccable English. Take, make them, help them. Uh, it is allowed. It is definitely allowed. And then uh, just to enable them to complete the, the journal articles, uh, complying with the international standards, and uh, up to the professional standard decided by the editors of all these leading journals of ISI. Okay. And the establishment of the National um, the Research Fund, this is very interesting. It appears they are going to work with relevant uh, institutions. I like this one. This is definitely needed. With that fund, the uh, universities and colleges can do wonders. Then um, for transforming the regulatory system, this is equally very, very, they, they, I think the umbrella institution will be Higher Education Commission of India. Under that, we have councils, four councils, National Higher Education Regulatory Authority, National Accreditation uh, Council, then the Higher Education Grant Council, 
and general education council the mandates and activities functional uh, are totally different as suggested by the as signified by the titles you can imagine what is it all about so and this state, the, the report makes a very interesting statement mechanism mechanism to avoid human interference with the efficiency transparency and accountability this will be the best solution as i can say i have to be very blunt here if a college management collects 60 lakhs for recruiting someone on a regular post in an aided college that's a crime that's definitely a crime you know and it will definitely affect the quality of teaching if there are 10 candidates nine candidates are not able to pay the money only one candidate is able to pay i have to be very frank here very blunt here and if that guy is selected on the basis of money give that, that then there is no governance no education co governance so this regulatory framework will definitely is aimed at ensuring the so called educational governance this is certainly good for education then professor institution even here again they repeat the report repeat so i will just read out uh, uh, what is this no it's okay uh, even here they say in other fields shall aim at becoming the multi institute uh, disciplinary institution even te technology related universities are also supposed to be multi um, um, uh, disciplinary institutions offering holistic education so this is a predominant one i have explained i think i have explained clearly how to come and the, the challenge of combining it, which we are going to learn during the course of the institutions. Okay, this is uh, what is all about. And then adult education, that's a lifelong learning. Anybody can, um, particularly through the open distance uh, learning system. And at one point in India, you know, the famous Sanjay Gandhi's five point program, each one teach one. The challenge was to each one to catch one and then to teach one. That's why they use the word voluntarism, voluntarism and community involvement in successful practice, getting the people um, uh, uh, engaged in adult education. That's a very good one. And then there is going to be adult education centers in each state will facilitate. And uh, the, before I wind up, I would like to uh, say that, you know, um, it appears that in each district, there will be at least one multidisciplinary university uh, with uh, at least 3,000 students. I think that will evolve in the course of uh, implementing the policy. Now, making it happen, you know, we know that there are deep concerns, concerns of all stakeholders. Like, uh, three, I have classified concerns into three. How to address the deep concerns of stakeholders? Many, many concerns will be expressed. And how to manage the transition from old to the new system? how to fund the transition cost. Whenever you embark on a major initiative, there will be some transition cost and how to, how to fund that transition cost. So the new policy space and the institutional framework degree <coughs> conscious, uh, I don't have to read out actually uh, emerging issues, but it, uh, just let me make a statement that just uh, wind up my speech, you know. Um, uh, there is ample justification for the new education policy. And um, we can, we all can collectively and individually contribute to that one. And uh, collectively together, we can make a difference and uh, make the principal contours and tenants of the new education policy see the light of reality. I will be available for questions. And uh, if there are any questions, thank you very much for the great opportunity. I